This presentation was recorded at the 2015 ANZICS ACCCN Annual Scientific Meeting. So one of the things um, we're always keen to do in this session is not just bring you results of um, studies, but advertise the next upcoming study that you might like to participate in. And so Di Mackle is here to do that today. Di's a registered nurse from um, Wellington ICU, but she's also the ICU Trials Project Manager just don't touch a thing, um, at the Medical Research Institute. <laughs> if you touch it and it goes the wrong way, we can't get back. Um, yeah, so at the Medical Research Institute of New Zealand. Um, so she has great experience in managing several of the more recent ICU trials, such as the HEAT study, SPLIT study, um, and is also going to be the monitor and trial manager for uh, studies such as PEPTIC and ICU ROCS and TARGET, which she's here to talk to us about today. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you for the introduction, Rachel, and I'd like to thank the organisers for having me here today to talk about Target. So as Rachel mentioned, I'm the project manager for New Zealand for the Target study, but today I'm speaking to you on behalf of the whole management committee. So what I used is this. Yeah. It worked. Um, uh, so the management committee is headed by Marianne Chapman and Sandy Peak, who are both from South Australia. Uh, Lorraine Little is a very experienced project manager and she has overall um, say, I guess, <laughs> and she's responsible for the Australian sites. And so many of these people have been working on this um, program of research for a number of years, so I'm going to walk you through what they've already done and then talk about what we're doing soon. Um, unfortunately, I have no personal disclosures to make, um, but the uh, a study feed is being provided by Fresenius Carby in Germany um, and so they are providing the feed but the grant funds are paying for the labelling and shipping um, and Fresenius Carby have no um, input into the design or conduct of the study. I'd like to acknowledge these organisations, the National Health and Medical Research Council in Australia and the Health Research Council in New Zealand for funding. Um, the ANZICS Clinical Trials Group for endorsement of this study and the ANZIC Research Centre in Monash University in Melbourne and the Medical Research Institute of New Zealand where I work in Wellington um, as the coordinating centres. Right. So what do we already know? Well we know that nutrition is essential for ICU patients, especially if they're mechanically ventilated and they're going to stay in the ICU for a few days. Um, for most patients, the enteral route is preferred over parenteral. We know that clinicians like it. It's cheaper. It's more physiological. So it's a bit like food. Um, it might reduce sepsis and it has a beneficial effect on the gut function. Um, most clinicians aim to start enteral nutrition within 24 hours of, nutrition, of um, mechanical ventilation or ICU admission and they aim for a rate of one mil per kilogram per hour. But um, there's a couple of issues really. Um, so although it's widely believed, um, even in the ICU setting, that energy in equals energy out, and there's lots of um, predictive measures of how we calculate that um, requirement, um, but there's really an absence of high quality evidence about that calculation, so we don't really know. And so at the moment, as I said, we calculate the calorie requirements um, at 24 kilocalories per kilogram per day, roughly, which works out to be about 1,800 kilocalories per day. But what we've seen in multiple observational studies is that we only really deliver between 50 and 70 percent of those calculated goals. So we never actually deliver what we think we should, and we don't know if it matters or not. So the investigators began the process of developing evidence with an observational study of usual practice. Um, this study was uh, conducted as part of a one-day point prevalence study in 2010. I'm sure some of your units will have participated. There was 38 ICUs across Australia and New Zealand um, from a variety of settings who were in this study. So the aim from, for the nutrition um, part of it was to determine the most commonly prescribed enteral nutrition and also to find out of how much calorie dense enteral nutrition was being used in the units. So there's 522 adult patients enrolled um, and 220 of them were receiving enteral nutrition on the study day and 91% of those were ventilated. 
So what this showed was that about half were receiving, as you'd expect, one kilocalorie per mil, um, but a significant number were actually receiving a calorie-dense enteral feed. Now this study didn't aim to f um, ask why they were receiving that, so we don't know, um, but when you look at the predictive factors, there really weren't any differences between the groups with demographics, severity of illness, or mechanical ventilation. Um, there was also a tendency of the patients who were receiving a higher density feed to have a lower 28-day mortality. Now, obviously, this is an observational study, so that just um, is hypothesis generating. So the next step was to conduct a feasibility or pilot study. Um, so the aim of this study was to see whether it was possible to deliver more calories if you gave a 1.5 kilocalorie per mil formulation when you compared that to a 1 kilocalorie per mil. Um, and so this formulation was given over the first 10 days of enteral feeding. Uh, we also had a few secondary aims. We wanted to see if there were any complications if you give a higher density feed. Um, and also with the view of doing a larger randomised control trial, we wanted to determine the baseline 90-day mortality as well as a potential recruitment rate for a large study. And um, an important part of it was also to test the blinding and delivery of enteral nutrition formulations. So this study was published in 2014, as you can see there. Five Australian ICUs participated in this, and they enrolled 112 patients. Uh, the groups um, had very similar baseline characteristics. They had a mean age of 56, 75% were men, and they had a moderate Apache score of uh, 22 and 23. So what the study showed is it is possible to, uh, I don't know how to point actually, but you can see in the top two graphs that um, there was clear separation between the two groups. So there was a 46% increase in calorie delivery when you gave 1.5 kilocalorie per mil formulation compared to one, which I guess you might expect, but there's the evidence. Um, and importantly, there was um, the 1.5 kilocalorie per mil formulation wasn't associated with any of the complications you might think, such as diarrhea, vomiting, or increased gastric residual volumes. So the um, rest of the, the secondary outcomes of this study, um, there was no difference between the number of days ventilated, ICU or hospital stay, or ICU or hospital mortality. Um, there was, however, a trend towards a reduced 90-day mortality in the patients giving 1.5 kilocalories per mil, although this was not statistically significant. Um, and importantly, this, the results of this supported the conduct of a large-scale trial. Um, before I move on, I just want to mention this paper which was published in the New England Journal of Medicine this year. Um, I'm sure many of you will have read it and also the uh, letters to the editor about it. Um, so this was a randomised controlled trial conducted in Saudi Arabia by Arabi and Co. Um, and it compared permissive underfeeding to standard care. So it had a primary end point of 90-day mortality and had 80% power to detect an absolute mortality difference of 8%, which is quite a lot. Um, 894 patients were enrolled, and the study showed there was no difference in mortality between the two groups. But what you um, really need to look at in this paper is that their standard care actually only delivered 70% of the recommended calories to patients. Um, so it was really a trial of underfeeding versus even more underfeeding. So we actually still don't know the answer about what happens to patients if um, they receive a full amount of feed. So this uh, brings us to the main study, hopefully the definitive one, um, the target nutrition study, which is the augmented versus routine approach to giving energy trial, and I'm sure you've all realised by now we love acronyms. Um, no easy way to say this slide, it's a um, study of 4,000 patients, it's multi-centre across Australia and New Zealand, it's double-blinded, randomised, controlled, parallel group, phase three study. So the primary aim of this study is to see whether day 90 mortality is improved in mechanically ventilated patients who receive an energy dense um, nutrition when compared with routine care. And the secondary aim is to see whether their functional outcomes are improved. So as you can see here, the um, primary outcome is all cause mortality at 90 days. There's a number of secondary outcomes. Um, we're looking at uh, death at a number of time points, hospital discharge 28 and 180 days, 
ICU and hospital free days. Uh, for patients who die, we'll look at the time from randomization until death. The organ support free days there refers to um, ventilation free days, vasopressor free days, and also the percentage of patients uh, who require renal replacement therapy. Um, we're also uh, looking at the infective side of things, so the percentage of patients who re require antibiotics or who have positive blood cultures, and as I mentioned, the functional outcomes. So the inclusion criteria, uh, obviously um, adults age 18 or above, patients who are mechanically ventilated and about to commence or um, have already commenced enteral nutrition in the past 12 hours. And they need to be expected to receive that enteral nutrition until the day after tomorrow, which is a common thing in ICU trials. Obviously there's a few exclusion criteria. Um, if the patient's already been fed in any way for the, um, more than 12 hours in the ICU, they are excluded. Um, if, if the um, protocolised goal rate is contraindicated in some way, so if they have a fluid restriction or something like that, or if they need a specific type of feed, they can't be enrolled. Um, as with all um, trials with a 90-day mortality outcome, we're excluding patients in whom death is inevitable um, or who have a condition, an underlying condition which is not survivable to, or not thought to be survivable to 90 days. Um, obviously patients with burns, so 15% or more of burns because they have a different nutritional requirement to the rest of ICU and if they've already been in the study. So what will the study actually involve? So patients will be randomised one to one. They're either going to receive uh, one kilocalorie per mil formulation or 1.5 kilocalories per mil. Um, the goal rate will be exactly the same for both groups and um, that's calculated from their ideal body weight at randomisation. The protein's virtually identical in both formulations, which is important, and they'll have identical packaging. Um, and that picture there is taken from the pilot study, showing what it looks like. Um, so patients will be fed through until day 28, unless they no longer require enteral feed, or they die, or they're discharged from the ICU. And as you can see, the follow-up is right through to 180 days. So how are we going? Uh, we're going pretty well, actually. We've um, secured a 3.5 million Australian dollars uh, a grant from the NH and MRC and uh, 1.2 million New Zealand dollars from the Health Research Council, um, which sounds like quite a lot of money, but it's actually not for 4,000 patients. Um, as I mentioned, we have CTG endorsement. Uh, the study sites have been selected. There's 42 in Australia and 11 in New Zealand. Um, we've been working with Fresenius Carby with, for the enteral feed. Um, the study protocol is finalised and that is being submitted in Australia um, for ethics. We already have ethics um, approval in New Zealand. Um, the study website is, um, is being developed by a New Zealand company called Spiral Software. And some of you may be familiar with the look of it. It's the same company who did the heat study, the split study and SUPPN. Yep. Um, and uh, I think most of you will agree that they were very easy to work with. Uh, the Data Safety and Monitoring Committee has been appointed. They've had their first meeting. We're very glad to have Professor Deborah Cook from Canada as the chairperson, and uh, uh, their first meeting went well. I'm just going to talk briefly about a feasibility study that we're doing before we start Target, which is called RACE. Uh, so RACE stands for the Rapid and Accurate Categorisation of Critically Ill Patients to Identify Outcomes of Interest for Longitudinal Studies. And what that actually means <laughs> is, uh, so we're aiming to find a quick and accurate way for categorising patients at baseline so that when we come to 180 days we can have a, a more of a suitable follow-up for those patients. So there's um, eight categories we're putting them into. Um, there's five for the under 65 year olds, which looks at employment status, disabilities and things like that. And for the over 65s, it's really related to their ability to care for themselves. 
and, uh, and there's an other category. Um, so for this feasibility study, we're aiming for a total of 120 patients between the four sites listed there. Two of those sites are up and running and have enrolled 30 patients. And um, so the outcome of this study will guide the follow-up which is done for the target study. Um, this is our uh, timeline. Um, 2014 and 2015 has been devoted to getting set up for the trial. We're currently in the um, final stages of finalising all study documents and we'll be trialling the study database by the end of the year. Um, we're aiming to get the first sites up and running by the beginning of next year and fingers crossed we'll be enrolling our first patient about February next year. So study enrolment um, is likely to take about three years and that's based on the rec recruitment rate in the feasibility study. So I'd like to um, thank all our sites. Hopefully I haven't missed anyone out. They're not actually in alphabetical order, sorry. And um, we're really looking forward to getting started and working with you all. That's all. Thank you. Great presentation. And what I'd like to do just before we start with questions is just acknowledge um, Di and the other trial managers, project managers that we have managing these big studies. Um, without people such as Di and the project managers, Paul, Jeff, anyone else um, wouldn't be publishing their trials in the New England and JAMA. So uh, thank you very much for keeping them on track as much as the studies. Um, so are there any questions from the floor first? It's just on ideal, sorry, it's just on ideal body weight. There's no adjustment. Doesn't that risk you underfeeding, say, a 50% or underfeeding a 50% burns and overfeeding, say, a minor elective abdominal surgery? Um, so I might be asking Adam. But so burns patients are excluded if they've got more than 15%. Um, with regards to overfeeding, it's something we have given a lot of thought to. Um, so there's not really any evidence that overfeeding enterally makes a difference, not like if you overfeed IV. Um, and we've also got a few safeguards in place, so the, um, the, limit, the rate is limited at 100, so even if someone's, if they're really, really tall and um, would require, you know, might get more, that's capped at 100. And the clinician has the option after five full days of feeding to um, change to open label. Um, but as for the underfeeding someone very, very sick, Adam? Sorry, Tux, um, so I guess the standard care just represents what standard care practice is at the moment, which most people end up delivering, um, uh, you know, a meal per kilo. Um, and uh, uh, I guess I got caught a bit on the hop, but um, uh, mo most people don't have indirect calorimetry, and I think most people just is meant to represent what's meant to be a pragmatic study, which happens at most units and, and most intensivists uh, and dietitians do that at the moment. I think don't that's, make that's true. That um, you know, none of the observational studies show that a, a severity of illness is adjusted for. So it's based on that standard care evidence that we have at the moment. Jeff uh, Shaw from Christchurch. I uh, just want to ask a question about the limits of pushing high energy, high dense energy uh, nutrition when you have competing priorities with glycemia. Say, for example, if you've got a glucose now of you know, 12, 13, 14, whatever, choose your number, which is a bit high, yep. and you're on, let's say, 10 units of insulin an hour, in your protocol in version two, which I have not seen, but do you have provision for reducing the feeds to gain glycemic control when you trade one up against the other? Yeah. There's, um, uh, we won't, there's no aim to reduce the feed if the um, blood sugars are high. Um, so we've set the limit of 10 that um, sites should start treating it after that. Um, and they do that as per their normal standard protocolised care within their unit. There's no, there's no insulin protocol within the pro study protocol. So, so what will you be advising units that, because um, I think most people, although it's not widely published, will reduce the amount of nutrition if they do end up with difficulty. So what will you be advising people to do? I, do you want to answer that, Adam? So Jeff, um, we've actually the body's got a mechanism that 
you will slow get down gastric emptying from hyperglycemia per se. So it doesn't really matter what you put in the stomach, that won't get emptied out anyway, so until the blood glucose comes down. So, so people who think that they're adjusting the rate that goes into the stomach will affect the blood glucose. It, it, it's a flawed argument because it actually is the other way around, that until the blood glucose comes down, the stomach won't empty, therefore you won't get calorie absorption. Well, yeah, you'll attenuate any poten potential harm. So, so it, within a pragmatic design, you probably can't then do more than what the body does normally. Thank you. Uh, George Breyer from John Hunter. Just a, a quick question for the provision in the protocol, because one of the, the findings we have is that no matter how hard we try to set targets, whether it's dialysis or nutrition, we found that unexpected interruptions, travel trips to CT, yeah. surgery, trauma, uh, make us rarely at reach by the end of the 24 hours that target. What's the provision in the protocols for all those instances in which you're going to have to stop feeds during the allocation? Um, I mean, I think that's a reality of ICU. We do have to stop feed for various things, and that's, um, I think I'm correct in saying that's right, that's fine in the protocol. I mean, that's one of the things that this study is aiming to look at, really, if you can um, if you are missing hours in the day where you're not fed, at least on the other hours, you're getting 1.5 times as many calories. So perhaps overall um, you will reach the, at least the goal um, caloric requirement, even if not the goal rate. And you'll be collecting reasons for stopping? Yes, it. yeah, there, um, we do collect reasons for the stopping. It's not a question, it's a, it's a comment. It's more, this is a, a, a large 4,000 patient pragmatic randomised controlled trial. Um, so there will be, the noise is going to be distributed equally between both arms. So there'll be patients in either arm that may, whose metabolic uh, requirements and whose energy expenditure is going to be, is going to be quite, quite different indeed. So I think that um, the, the heterogeneity in the population should be equally distributed if the randomisation process is OK. Yeah. Oh, just two quick things. Um, one, I suppose, we, if we get hyperglycemia, we change the feed as the more regular sort of thing we do, but I suppose one could just continue as is. And I suppose the second one is what do you do about all the stoppages? Well, um, one of the things we're talking about at the moment is saying you've got to put in 1.5 litres per day. You put in whatever you can, whenever, but at the end of the day, I want 1.5 litres in. A bit like what we do with fluid balance and hemofiltration, so it's another option. Perhaps I could make one more comment about the hyperglycemia thing. The, the, man, the, the five days um, also has the opt-out of clinicians considering it inappropriate to continue at, at, at maximum volume. So one of your options is to go to open label feed earlier if hyperglycemia is an, an issue. And we're also assuming that the um, patients that are, giving, or that are given augmented nutrition will have a greater rise in serum in um, gl blood glucose. We don't know if that's going to be... That know. may not be the case. We, it, it, there's a physiological basis for why it might be, but it might, might not be. No. Yeah. Comments? Thanks very much, Di. Thank you.